How's it going everybody and welcome back to our NSXT series. In this video, I'm going to go over a high level overview of the segments capability. Now, this is going to be something that we're going to have to use throughout NSXT for a variety of reasons. So I want to take a couple minutes and kind of go over the details of what's going on and how all this stuff works. Again, this will be shared to you um, in the download section. So if you are a member already, you'll be able to download. Basically, I'm just going to do a copy and paste into uh, a PDF, and I'll PDF it out. So without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get out of the way. I'm going to do some diagrams too. I have a diagram here ready to go to kind of reinforce the textual theoreticals with a diagram as well, just so that we're all on the same page. So let me go ahead and get out of the way. So the segments that we have, there are two types. We have the overlay and then we have the VLAN backed. Now, the difference between the two, I'm going to get into in a little bit more detail here in just a moment, but I want to, the first thing that I want to cover is more of a operational piece when it comes to deployment, naming convention, use case, stuff like that. So it's a good practice to properly name a segment based on its use. So segments are going to be used in two different places. You're going to have segments that are going to be connecting to virtual machines, whether they're VLAN backed or they're overlay segments. So, and so it's a good idea to, if you're going to be using a VLAN backed segment to do a migration from VDS port groups to VLAN backed segments, then that's going to be something you're going to want to highlight the name in. You don't, you don't have to do that, right? But it's a good thing to do. A lot of times customers will have the VLAN already named and their VDS port groups. And so we'll take the naming convention that they've already got and we'll add in NSX. So for example, if the VDS segment is called VLAN 101-web-web dash web app dash say Epic. I deal with a lot of hospitals, so Epic is used quite a bit. Right, so maybe that's the name of your VDS port group. And you've got any of the servers that belong to that capability are named as such. Well, if you do NSX, come down here and do the same thing, but you put NSX in front of it. Now there's going to be a small variation in the icon that's just next to the uh, icon of the port group when it's an NSX port group versus a V. Uh, of vSphere distributed switch port group, but nevertheless, that's something I wanted to throw that in there. So naming, name it with the VLAN, the VMs will reside in and the VMs use. So this is going to be VLAN 101 and then web app, so on and so forth. Now I don't know if Epic actually relies on that. All I know is I deal a lot with Epic. So if you, if you go to a hospital or a healthcare facility and you see the people typing in the computer, more often than not, they're using a program called Epic. I have no idea what it stands for. I just know that's what it's used, it's healthcare related. If the segment will be for the edge node to Tor connectivity, follow the same best practice as the VM. So whatever the VM is, and then you have edge node one to you know, Tor three or whatever it's gonna be, and then identify the VLAN. So those are for VLAN, and you don't, you don't have to do the, if it's gonna be an overlay segment, you can do the same thing. You can say, you know, NSX overlay web app, you know, whatever it's going to be. If you're migrating from VDS port groups to overlay segments, that's one way to do it as well. Now, VLAN backed is the first one we have, right? And VLAN backed is a layer two broadcast domain implemented like a traditional VLAN in the physical infrastructure. Any two VMs on any two hosts in this VLAN, any traffic between these VMs will be sent inside the assigned VLAN over the physical infrastructure. This, this VLAN must exist on the physical network and the SBI must exist if the layer two traffic will be routed. So what this means, this line right here, this means that the top of rack device, whatever that might look like, will have to have that VLAN created on it and the SBI or sub-interface, depending on uh, how you're doing your deployment model, will need to be in place. Now, more often than not, most of my customers are gonna do an SVI, and 
the majority of my customers that have any type of, they can be used NSX for the firewalling, and they might have a VXLAN fabric that they are connecting all their servers to. Well, guess what? Then you're dealing with an Anycast distributed gateway, and you're going to be sending your traffic up to the top of REC Nexus 9K or your Arista switch or whatever it is you're terminating to, and you're going to get the traffic back and forth that way. So this is the VLAN-backed option is simple for a lot of people to migrate to because A, operationally, it's identical to a VDS port group. The only difference is, is you add in capabilities for NSX, like the firewalling and, you know, uh, stuff like that. In the event that you're going to be doing overlay, which we'll talk about here in, in a moment, it's a little bit of a different design. So, because you can go and start moving VMs from a VDS port group to an NSX port group just by changing the port group that they're in, and things happen like that. I mean, I've, this is the fastest way to an uh, NSX migration you can have. Uh, as long as you're already on the correct hardware and the correct versions of code, it's a cinch to get that into play. In the event that the segment will be used on an edge node to communicate with a top of rack device, the top of rack device connected device connected interface will use .1Q7 interface or an SPI. A logical interface will be created on the edge node and act like any other layer 3 device. Or, I'm sorry, like any other layer 3 interface. A common deployment method is leveraging VLAN back segments as a migration method to NSXT services like distributed firewall. So, an NVDS or VDS with NSX enhancements is added to a host and segments that are created that that the host learns from NSX Manager. So what do I mean by NVDS or VDS with NSX enhancements? So in 6.7 update three, which is gonna be the version of code that will have been deployed to all of our ESXi hosts, we're gonna be deploying NSX VIBs and adding another host switch for NSX. We're gonna call it the NSX VDS or an NVDS for short. If you're dealing with ESXi and vCenter 7 or above, you have the ability of pushing the NSX VIBs directly to the distributed switch itself. And then once you push it to the switch, any port groups that you create on that switch will have NSX enhancements to it. So, and then that gets into a design of, okay, do I how many different VDSs do I take? So if you're going to deal with, say, for instance, vSphere Cloud Foundation, VCF for short, this is what they do. This is one of the, the profile models that you'll go through and deal with. Do you have just one VDS with all of your capabilities on there for infrastructure like management, storage, um, vMotion, fault tolerance, all that type of stuff, vSphere HA? Do you have all that riding on your single VDS and then you have a couple of interfaces dedicated to data for all of your virtual machines sitting on that VDS port group. So you don't have another dedicated NVDS. Now, when we get further along in the series and we start migrating to 7.0 and I do the upgrades to 7.0, we'll see what that looks like because the hosts that we're deploying all this stuff to I'm going to do a ESXi 7 upgrade, and I'm also going to do a vCenter 7 upgrade. So we're going to be on the newest versions of code and getting all that stuff working the way that we need it to. So there's a couple of really cool ways that we can handle that, but in the, in the event that things are going that direction, we're going to do an upgrade first. This is one of the things you have to keep into consideration. Most of the customers that I work with that go 7.0 from, let's say they're on a 6.7 environment with, uh, and the, the key thing isn't the, the ESXi or the vCenter specifically. It's actually the, the VDS version. So in 6.7, you're on VDS 6.6. In vCenter 7, you're on 7.0. So you're looking for a VDS version of 7.0. And if you do that, then you'll be able to install the, N the NSX VIBs directly to the switch itself. Well, it's actually not in the, the, the switch itself. It's installed at the host level. The host joins the, the, the VDS 7.0, and then 
you're able to take advantage of those capabilities. And it and when you're doing the deployment, you can choose whether you're doing NVDS or a VDS. And we'll take a look at exactly where that comes into play and up, uh, later on down the series. So that's where that piece comes into play. So if you're going to do that, that's when uh, the customer conversation has to come into play. Okay, do we keep everything where the way it is today and, you know, we keep the VDS where it is or do we start to carve it up into different VDS, uh, vSphere distributed switches with dedicated uplinks and we put, say, we have an infrastructure VDS, so management, storage, vMotion, fault tolerance, all that stuff is handled on one VDS and then we have another VDS that handles VLAN back segments and overlay connectivity. That's a conversation you need to have because then you're going to install the VDS, the, um, you're going to install your NSX VIBs to a specific VDS, not all of them. So that's, and you have to choose which VDS you want to deploy to. So I've been through this a few times, so I know logically from memory what that looks like, but um, the reason I'm, I spend so much time on this is because of the fact that it's you, you need to know about it ahead of time, right? It's a, it's a pre-deployment figure it out before you deploy. Um, can you choose that ahead of time or after the fact? You can. Um, if you just choose to deploy an NVDS, you can. But then migrating from NVDS to VDS, it, there's no point. There's, it's, well, I mean, any situation is possible, right? But if you know what to do before you get there, you can make the suggestion, hey, we're going to go this way. I'm going to talk about real briefly a customer rollout that I was doing where we were, it was um, kickoff call on a, on a client project. And we were talking about, uh, I was presenting what we were going to do because they wanted to go VLAN back segments. And I made the comment of if we're on 6.7, because I didn't know their environment that well. I was just getting familiar with their environment. I said, if you're on 6.7, we're going to have to have a dedicated NVDS, which means we're going to need dedicated interfaces for uh, on your ESXi hosts, the physical connections that are going to be dedicated to your um, uh, NSX connectivity. So if they're already allocated elsewhere, or if you need to add more ports, that's something we're going to have to talk about. Or we can upgrade to vSphere 7 across the board, ESXi, vCenter, and then upgrade the VDS to 7.0. And once that's done, then we can just install NSX directly to the, well, in this case here, it would be, you'd be installing it, to, uh, pushing the VIBs to the host, but you'd be adding NSX enhancements to a VDS. And that's ultimately what they went, went and did. So it can be done. That's actually how my customer did it. Uh, it actually gave us a couple weeks downtime when it came down to that because uh, we ended up having to bring in a virtualization engineer to do all that work because that fell outside of the scope of what I do. So, um, but as you can see, th those are the capabilities that you can do. Anyway, um, like I said, a very common migration is VLAN back segments as a uh, migration away from traditional VDS port groups. So, uh, you have the NVDS or VDS with uh, NSX enhancements. Uh, there will be two port groups with the same VLAN ID, one regular VDS port group, the other NSX. And both port groups will leverage the SPI sitting on the Tor device. And so all you'll have to do is change the port group at the VM level. So there's a, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can do migrate VMs to another network. So if you know what networks need to move, you can do a, a VM or two at a time to see what it looks like. Because connectivity will still be the same, right? Um, so when you change on a per VM basis, which is exactly how my customer did it, here's a piece of cake. But then you can go into the networking tab and click on the migrate VMs to another network option. If you've got 50 VMs sitting there, guess what they're going to do? You're going to move all their NICs at one time. Boom. You can also script it if you want to and get the, the job done that way. VLAN back segments could be used in two places. The first is a migration method from regular VDS port groups to NSX port groups. The second is a connection from the edge node to the Tor device to allow static and or dynamic routing. When users connectivity to the outside, the edge node VDS will need a port group that will allow trunking. 
And what this means is you'll need uh, the, uh, the, the edge cluster where the device, so you have a dedicated edge cluster and a dedicated compute cluster. When you do it like that, your edge nodes won't have NSX installed on them. It's a little bit different when you have them all sitting in the same cluster and you have the edge nodes are going to be um, getting the installation set up that way. And it gets a little funky. I, I, I've i never actually deployed it because no customer I've ever worked with has ever gone that direction. So if they did, I, I work with people that have done it. So it wouldn't be that, that big of a deal to ask them how they did it and you know get the answer. But um, when you do a dedicated edge cluster and a dedicated compute cluster, it's pretty straightforward. All you have to do is make sure that, and, and your edge nodes, the hosts that the edge nodes sit on, they don't get installed with NSX. They're just hosting the edge node. And in order for that to work, you need to go through and uh, make sure that the, the uplink that the edge nodes will be using from the ESXi host northbound to the top of rack, that they're just trunking. So that you can tag the VLANs you need to tag. Now, so um, the second has a connection. So a VM MAC addresses will be learned by the physical network. Uh, VM traffic from the outside world will flow through the Tor device down to the transport node through the NSX enabled VDS port group to the VM or the yeah, NSX enabled VDS or the NVDS uh, to the, uh, down to the port group, uh, port group to the VM. Now overlay segments. Uh, this segment uses Geneve encapsulation. Geneve technically doesn't need to be uh, capitalized like that. So the encapsulation, when you do like a Wireshark um, capture, it's just a capital G and then Geneve. Any traffic from one host to another host or to an edge device, all traffic is encapsulated with Geneve. So there's actually tunnels built, and this is only with overlay segments. Overlay segments that are in the data plane. There's a control plane to it as well. So it's both in uh, control plane and data plane. So there's a, a tunnel built between your hosts and the edge node. The edge node connection is built when you map a segment to an edge gateway or to a, a connected gateway, tier zero or tier one. And then from there, you are gonna give the um, once you, once you have that in place, you're deployed. Now, um, as I was going through my labbing and stuff like that and verification process, I learned a couple of things that I hadn't really paid attention to in the past because they really weren't super uh, not relevant, but I just wasn't on the lookout for them, I guess you could say. So um, one of the things that I did from a demonstration purposes was I configured a tier zero active active gateway upstream to a couple of top of racks uh, routers. And then I connected the segments that I wanted to connect to the tier zero gateway and I connected it. That's all I did. I noticed that only a services router was created when I did that. No distributed router. So VRF3 was created, not VR, it was a VRF1. Typically, you're going to see VRF1 as your distributed router. No, maybe it's the other way around, VRF3, but either way. The, I lost my train of thought. Um, I only saw a services router deployed. And then I went back and I mapped a couple of VMs to the segment. Then the distributed router was uh, built because I gave the segment an IP address and it had mapped connections to uh, to VMs, so therefore a distributed router was deployed. And it's once you map a VM NIC, a VM VNIC, to a segment, and that segment is going back and forth, but has not been connected to a gateway yet. Distributed router is deployed, and that's where this host-to-host -host stuff comes into play. When you are connecting to a gateway. And you don't connect it directly to a gateway, right? You don't, um, the gateway itself, uh, the edge node, the, the, the edge gateway, or the edge device, the virtual machine, the OVA that we deploy, it itself is nothing more than a virtual machine that has an empty container, that there's no services running on it. 
it's only when you turn on tier zero or tier one gateways and stuff like that that things start to work on it. So it's an empty shell and then you deploy services to it, routing, firewall, edge gateway, all that good happy fun stuff that goes along with it, VPNs, uh, NAT, load balancer, etc. Stuff that we'll cover later on down the road. Now when we go through and do that, the, ed, uh, the host to edge device is a services router deployment because you're looking at the local routing table of your host and you're trying to figure out where do I have to send the traffic. So, and things are routed internally on, at the host level when it comes to doing inter overlay segment communication. So if you've deployed multiple overlay segments and everything has been deployed correctly and you've got VMs sitting on different hosts on different segments, so let's say the app tier you need to talk to the database tier, for example, or you know, you're know you in one, and we're gonna talk about this more when we get into the firewall section, which will actually be the next section after the routing section. Um, Actually, no, probably not that way. I'm probably going to do load balancer and NAT before I do that because firewall will take, I'll be able to add those services in and then lock everything down with the firewall. Um, but anyway, not the point. When you've got everything locked down, you might have a scenario where you might remote into a VM and then it, you may have to do a jump to another box or some, some scenario like that. One way or the other, there's going to be connectivity that's going to be needed potentially inter-segment and then you can lock down with a firewall, right? So all that communication would be Geneva encapsulated between your ESXi hosts. So these segments will have their default gateway terminate on either a tier zero or tier one gateway depending on the design. Now, when I say their default gateway, this line right here, their default gateway technically sits on the ESXi host, right? That's where the distributed router functionality comes into play. Think of like, uh, a VXLAN, any uh, any cache distributed gateway, right? If you've got six or seven ES or uh, Nexus 9K switches all running VXLAN, and you've got a bunch of devices attaching to it, think of the Nexus 9K switch as your ESXi host. Your traffic is hitting the the switch, and then you're able to either route between your VLANs or out of the fabric, so on and so forth. The ESXi host, the, every one of the devices has a logical router deployed to it in the overlay segment. And it's got a default gateway. So when you go through and you're testing the connectivity, I proved this out when we start doing connectivity like that before we deploy a gateway. The, the edge node, the tier zero or the tier one gateway is how you get out of the virtual environment via the gateway to the physical environment. That's how that works. You're not actually, the, the gateway doesn't actually sit on the tier zero gateway. That's actually, um, I should, should update that. So your segments, when you configure them, there will be connectivity to the tier zero gateway or the tier one gateway. And so far, all we've, in this section, um, all we've, we're going to be covering is uh, there's going to be single tier and then multi-tier routing, which we'll add in tier um, uh, tier one gateways down the road, but I want to cover everything tier zero first, and then we'll take a look at a multi-tier routing. Um, the segment will need to be mapped to the appropriate gateway with an IP address as its gateway. So the segment will be mapped to the appropriate gateway. So you'll need to you can map a segment A to the tier zero gateway, and you can map segment B to tier one gateway. And that's fine. That'll it'll work uh, the way that it needs to, and then traffic will route the way that it has to. So that will work just fine. So VM MAC addresses will not be learned by the physical network anymore. The physical network will learn the tunnel endpoint IP and MAC addresses. So the for every IP that you deploy, or every uplink you deploy to your either your NVDS or your VDS, you'll have a couple of different TEP IPs that will be the tunnels will be built between. And then you'll learn those IP and MAC addresses. Traffic between the hosts will be seen as TEP IPs communicating with each other. VM MAC addresses will be learned by the host and NSX manager. Traffic from the outside world to the VM will flow through a tier zero gateway, optionally a tier one gateway to the edge node over the segment to the host where the VM resides. 
So it'll once it hits the tier zero gateway or the edge node device, it will be encapsulated inside of Geneve to the, ed, the device that it's supposed to go reach to. The edge node, tra the edge node to transport node communication is Geneve encapsulated. And then there's some segment profiles, uh, segment capabilities here, how you would create it, um, name it, connectivity is going to be, who does it connect, uh, connectivity is going to be, um, who, which specific gateway is going to be going to. You can have straight layer two connections where you only have um, layer two connectivity set up between for whatever it might be, or it might be replication or, uh, or otherwise. Um, you can ch choose the gateway you want to connect to. The gateway IP, if it's going to be a overlay segment, you can apply an IP address. This is not uh, applicable to the VLAN back segment. You wouldn't configure an IP address there. Uh, this will be the default gateway of your de of uh, your segment, and this will be installed on all your ESXi hosts. Transport zone, you know, are you going to do overlay or VLAN backed? VLAN back requires the VLAN ID to be set. Uh, select which TZ the segment will be able to traverse. So again, a transport zone is a boundary. How wide of a berth do you give your segments for communication? DHCP. So you can do DHCP and have it set up. We're going to talk about that in a uh, once uh, the routing is done. We'll talk about that more in detail, and then we'll take a look at uh, traffic replication. Okay, so when we talk about broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast traffic replication, we need to understand exactly what that is. So broadcast is sent to all machines on the same layer two segment. So broadcast is going to be anything where you don't already know who you're trying to talk to, right? That's basically what a broadcast is communication for. Unknown unicast is split out all ports of a switch. You don't know where you're what you're trying to communicate with, so it's going to send it everywhere. Multicast is IGMP, the Internet Group Messaging Protocol. Traffic sent to selective destinations. IGMP is going to be the protocol that runs between the device, the endpoint, the receiver in a multicast flow, and the, the switch, or what they refer to as the last hop router. The last hop router is going to be your connection to the multicast enabled network. So I, you have an IGMP report that comes from the endpoint. So you, like for example, you open up a application on your computer or on your desktop, and it has a. You double click on that application, and when you open it up, it sends an IGMP join message to your default gateway. Your default gateway is your egress point off your network, right? But it is also the last hop router in a multicast flow. That IGMP join turns into a, uh, or actually, I take that back, an IGMP report. Not an IG, you know, I'm thinking PIM join. That IGMP report basically is, I want to join the multicast flow. It flips it to a PIM join, and then that is sent upstream to the source, so the source knows to send traffic to you. That's what that means. This is replicated to all TEPs in a particular VNI or uh, VXI network identifier. TEPs may be on different layer three networks if you need to do so. ARP over a layer three transport. So VM1 is sitting on host one and doesn't know the, bring my, uh, there we go. So VM1 on host one doesn't know the MAC address of VM2 on host two. So an ARP request is generated and sent to host one TEP. And then the ARP request is, once it's received on host one, the ARP request is sent to each TEP associated with a specific VNI. And it is unicast message from the source TEP to the destination TEP. And that's essentially, and that is no different than how you would do it in any other situation. If I am 10.1.1.10 and I want to talk to 10.1.1.20, but I don't know 10.1.1.20's MAC address, I need to have an IP to MAC binding. The reason why that's so important is because the switch that you're sending the traffic out onto from your local VNIC has to know which port 
that dot 20 is associated to and it learns that based off of the switch logically is learns mac addresses the switch itself unless there's a gateway on it like an ip address doesn't learn ips it just learns macs so it has to know what mac address binds to which port and then from there you can do an ip to arp uh, ip to mac binding and that's where arp comes into play now when it comes to replication modes this is important because there's two of them to worry about You've got hierarchical two-tier replication, where VM on host one sends an ARP request to host one TEP for VM two on host two. Host one TEP is in the same subnet as host two, and our host two TEP, host one TEP sends unicast copy of the ARP request to host two TEP, and then that's how the ARP uh, request goes out. And then VM1 on host1 sends an ARP request to host uh, to host1 tap for VM3 and host3. Host1 tap, or I should finish this one here first. Uh, sends a unicast copy to the uh, of the ARP request to the host2 tap. The ARP reply would then go back to host1 tap and populate the ARP table for that segment and you'd know you'd have an ARP to map uh, you'd have an ARP binding for VM1 and VM2 that are attached to the same segment and everything would be gro uh, groovy everything would work the way you would expect it to now this one here is if you're a little bit different the host 1 tap and the host 3 tap are in different subnets so you have to do a layer 3 communication host 1 send uh, sends a unicast copy to the remote multipoint tap, and then the mtap replicates the packet in the remote VXN segment using unicast. So it's almost like a proxy, if you will. Now, head on replication, so you end up having a uh, two tier where you propagate it to somewhere else if you need to reach something else. So if you're on the same subnet, then it's no big deal. Everything works out the way you would expect it to. When you're on a different subnet, you have to send it to a point in the network that can communicate between the two. And that's where that the MTEP is going to come into play. Head replication forwards bump traffic to all TEPs associated with a VNI. If host1 doesn't have a VM associated with that VNI, host1 doesn't get a copy of the bump traffic. Fairly straightforward stuff. And how you would make the difference on that networking, segments, new segment, replication mode, and select head end or two tier to do that. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is pretty much it for this introductory portion of the, the segments section. So we're going to start diving into that more in detail in the next video. I wanted to cover at least the high level details of how that all comes into work. So with that being said, I want to thank you guys for stopping by. If you have any questions, please leave a comment in the comment section below. Please like, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch all of you in the next video.